Hello, everybody. Welcome to this year's edition of uh, the Pacioli Prize. Um, I'm very pleased to see uh, these many people. I'm sorry for uh, the lengthy start, but now we are on track. And I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Levin for, for joining us today. So a little bit of a story of this, of this prize. Uh, we have established it in, uh, in 2011 and uh, it was targeted, uh, the intention was to, uh, you know, to target it to outstanding researchers in the, in the four pillars, in the four areas that, that are part of our tradition, uh, which are uh, science, economics, humanities, arts, and, uh, and languages. But, but the real intention was also to, you know, to recognize the outstanding profile of the researchers who are awarded the prize, but also to their ability to, uh, to uh, contribute new insight uh, and original insight to in the interplay uh, among these, uh, these disciplines and to the cross fertilizations uh, between among these, these areas. This is in the spirit of, of the work of, of Luca Pacioli. Um, so uh, Luca Bartolomeo Pacioli was an Italian mathematician, uh, just a little bit of history on, on, on the figure uh, to which the title and the, the prize is entitled. Uh, he was a Franciscan friar, uh, was born in, uh, in uh, San Sepulcro in Tuscany, and, and was a collaborator of, of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He moved to Venice uh, at the age of 20, more or less. He was born in uh, 1447 in, in Tuscany, and then he moved to Venice. He traveled uh, in, in, in Italy quite a bit, but he, he made his, his main contributions in, in Venice. And one of the reasons for choosing Pacioli uh, is also because he's known as the father of the accounting, uh, as, as it is known today, and, uh, and, and bookkeeping. He was, in fact, the first to publish a work on, double, on the double entry system which characterized the uh, Venetian uh, commerce uh, for centuries and was an outstanding innovation for, for the time in the science of, of accounting. And uh, yeah, for, that, for that reason, is, is referred in many, in, many, in many ways, in many senses, as the, the father of accounting and, and bookkeeping, as I said. But, but his work extended much further than, than, uh, and then extended beyond the borders of, of accounting to invest mathematics and other fields as, as well. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of, I mean, he, he wrote a, a widely and extensively on, on mathematics and, uh, and related fields. Uh, his books, uh, ma most famous books are Summa di Aritmetica Geometria Proporzioni e Proporzionalità, which, uh, of course, uh, you know, as the title says, goes a lot uh, further and away from, from accounting. De Viribus Quantitatis, uh, where he went on magic and puzzles and, uh, and, uh, and numeric uh, 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 quantitative uh, and the way the quantitative disciplines enter the magic and, and, and puzzles. Then he wrote Geometry, which was a, a translation of uh, Euclid's elements. And then the Divina Proporzione, uh, where he developed uh, again quantitative methods in in, in mathematics and in the arts, and in particular the golden ratio was, was part of, of, his, of his studies. So the Pacioli Prize, which we award today and which we have established, is therefore a tribute to the outstanding research profile of the recipients of the people and the scholars to which it is uh, awarded in their disciplines, but also in, uh, in uh, a tribute to their ability to reinterpret this, uh, in this interdisciplinary uh, approach to science that Pacioli embodied uh, more than 700 years ago uh, with his contributions in, in, the, in the many fields he worked on. Uh, in previous years, uh, since the establishment of the, of the prize, we have awarded this, uh, this uh, I mean, the, the award uh, to uh, distinguished figures in, uh, in science and culture, and I want to name them and recall them, them here. In 2013, uh, last year, he was, the prize was given to Jürgen Habermas, a German philosopher and historian and sociologist, and to Wang, Hiu Wang, uh, Wang Hui, a professor in contemporary Chinese uh, literature and intellectual history. In 2012, the prize went to Mario Draghi, economist and current head of uh, European Central Bank. And 2011, the start, the initial the inaugural uh, event, the prize went to Salvatore Settis, an out famous historian, art historian and archaeologist. So this year, the prize goes to Professor Simon Levin, 
George Moffat, professor of biology at Princeton uh, University, a PhD in mathematics and professor in biology, which tells you uh, a long story already uh, of the path he has made and then of, of why he's a perfect fit for, for the Pacioli uh, Prize. He's certainly one of the, of the experts and leading figures worldwide in the study of ecological systems uh, and their correlation with uh, socioeconomic mechanisms. Uh, his lecture today is entitled Channeling Luca Pacioli, Multidisciplinarity and a Sustainable Future. And there he will explore the challenges and opportunities that are inherent in the concept of, of sustainability. He will talk about how each of us uh, can contribute to a sustainable development, emphasizing the need uh, for a new approach to science, uh, to the science of, of sustainability itself as a science. So this was a small introduction. I'll, I'll take the stage again, but before, uh, uh, before doing that and leaving first the stage to uh, Marcello for, for the Laudatio, I'd like to thank uh, the colleagues and the members of the committee who selected uh, the prize. First of all, to Professor Carrado, who was the president of the committee, and the members, uh, Professors uh, Luco, Lucio Cortella, Ottorino De Lucchi, Ignazio Muso, and Massimo Raveri, and Dr. Alessandra Perlin, in staff of our uh, research unit. Uh, so, um, um, I'm done with this introduction. I now leave the stage to Marcello, Professor Pelillo. He is member, uh, his fellow of, of IEEE and uh, International Association for, of Path Recognition and director of the European Center of the Living Technology, one of the centers that makes, makes uh, interdisciplinarity as, as a mission. Okay. And Marcello will, will, will provide us with, with, uh, with a full rounded uh, profile of Professor Slavin's work and research. Thank you and thank you again for, for being here today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to deliver this laudatio in honor of Professor Simon Levin, the recipient of the 2014 Luca Pajoli Prize. Graduated in mathematics at the University of Maryland in 1964, Professor Levin spent 27 years at Cornell University, first as an assistant professor of mathematics and then as a professor of applied mathematics and ecology at the time when, as he himself once said, uh, most mathematics departments were not ready for a real commitment to applications, especially in biology. He then moved in to Princeton, where he is currently the George Moffat Professor of Biology and the director of the Center for Biocomplexity. Over his 50-year-long career, he collected an impressive number of prizes and awards, such as the Kyoto Prize in Basic Science in 2005, and last year the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. In recognition of his scientific contributions, he has been elected fellow in several scientific societies, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Ecological Society of America. More than 20 years ago, in 1992, in the same year uh, he moved to Princeton, Professor Levin published one of the most influential papers in modern ecology, which counts almost 5,000 citations to date. This was based on a lecture he gave a few years before in Toronto, uh, on the occasion of receiving the prestigious Robert McHart Award. In opening his paper and his speech, he confessed how difficult it was for him to choose the topic of his lecture. He said he considered several options, uh, including the interface between population ecology and ecosystem science, uh, the dynamics of structural populations, diffuse coevolution, life history response to variable environments, and so on. Only to conclude, I'm quoting, as I look back over my career, which had included flirtations with each of these problems, I was struck by what a patchwork it seemed. What was the thread, if any, that had guided my wanderings? He then asked himself. Now, this happened more than 20 years ago. Meanwhile, Professor Levin's scientific interests have broadened substantially to include epidemics, 
finance, economics, or more generally social sciences. So I guess you can imagine how challenging yet rewarding it has been for me to prepare this laudatio, trying to find the thread which Levin himself was looking for back in the 90s. And to summarize in a few minutes such an outstanding and multifaceted scientific career. In preparing my speech, it came to my mind that a British political philosopher, Sir Isaiah Berlin, once famously divided intellectuals into two broad categories. The hedgehogs, which according to an ancient Greek poet, know one big thing, and the foxes, which instead know many things, as he put it in his book. There exists a great chasm between those on the one side who relate everything to a central, single central vision, one system more or less coherent or articulate in terms of which they understand, think and feel. And on the other side, those who pursue many ends, often unrelated and even contradictory, connected, if at all, only in some de facto way for some psychological or physiological cause related by no moral or aesthetic principle. So according to Berlin, men like Plato, Dante, Pascal, Dostoevsky, and Nietzsche, to name just a few, belong to the hedgehogs, while men like Aristotle, Shakespeare, Montaigne, Pushkin, and Joyce belong to the foxes. Charles Darwin also made a similar distinction between splitters, those who make many species, and lumpers, those who make few. And in a similar vein, the eminent theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson, more recently, described two kinds of scientists. The unifiers, uh, whose driving passion is to find general principles which will explain everything, and the diversifiers, people whose passion is to explore details. Two kinds, as Dyson suggested, typified by two cities, Athens and Manchester, and by two great scientists, Einstein and Rutherford, respectively. Although all dichotomies look suspicious, and these ones are probably no exception, I think it makes sense to ask what category Simon Levin belongs to. Is he a hedgehog or a fox, a lumper or a splitter, a unifier or a diversifier? At first sight, one might be tempted to say that he looks like a fox who knows many things. Indeed, by looking at his vast scientific production, one can help being impressed by the breadth and diversity of the problems he worked on. You will find, for example, studies on the reciprocal insurance among Kenyan pastoralists, on the effectiveness and design of vaccines against influenza and other viral diseases, on the design of marine reserves for interactive species, on the spread of social norms, on collective decision-making in animal populations, such as how birds flock, and so on and so forth. But at the closer scrutiny, it becomes apparent that throughout his entire career, Professor Levin has constantly followed a coherent path and has been actually guided by a single unifying idea. If I have to find one sentence to sum up Simon Levin's scientific profile, I would say that he is a man in search of patterns, or more precisely, in search of the processes which produce them. Since the beginnings of his research work, in fact, he has been fascinated, I would even say obsessed, with the notion of a pattern, uh, with all its different manifestations in nature, and with the question of how patterns emerge across different scales within a complex dynamical system. As a matter of fact, it is precisely the interplay between the notion of a pattern and the notion of a scale which has characterized much of Levin's unique contribution to science. As he pointed out in his 92 paper I mentioned before, Understanding patterns in terms of the processes that produce them is the essence of science. Indeed, patterns are everywhere, and we seem to have a natural instinct for patterns. Probably the clearest example of pattern formation processes can be found in visual perception. 
We open our eyes and our visual system immediately and unconsciously tries to make sense of the outside world using the stimuli produced by the retina. And the same, of course, is true for all the other sensory faculties. Our instinct for patterns is so fundamental to our perceptual processes that we see patterns even when there is none. We see constellations in the night sky, we pretend to see forms in the clouds, and many visual illusions such as the famous Canitza's triangle are based precisely on this principle. In the first half of the 20th century, psychologists belonging to the so-called Gestalt school tried to understand the basic laws of pattern formation in perceptual processes. And they soon realized that this idea applies far beyond the limits of sensory experience to embrace high-level cognitive processes such as learning, memory, reasoning, and so forth. Isaiah Berlin, whom we met before, went so far as to contend that to understand is to perceive patterns. But of course, patterns do not exist only in the eye of the beholder. They are indeed constantly found in nature as well, at all levels of natural phenomena, ranging from the atomic to the cellular up to the ecological and the social ones. And most interesting phenomena within these fields have one fundamental thing in common. They can be abstractly thought in terms of a complex adaptive system, namely a system consisting of interacting components whereby the individual behavior of components affects the whole system and changes in the aggregate level in turn affect how the components behave. Ecological as well as economic and financial systems are typical examples of complex adaptive systems in which patterns at the macroscopic level do emerge from interactions and selection processes mediated at many levels of organization. As Professor Levin himself has pointed out in a recent interview, modeling a forest ecosystem in which there are a number of complicated relationships is not that different from the global financial system of banks, investors, businesses, and financial markets. Just as the global financial crisis was sparked by a handful of players, a change in one species can impact an entire forest ecosystem. Thanks to Levin's distinctive mathematical approach, we now have a deeper understanding of the dynamics underlying the emergence of complex behavioral patterns in nature. And his studies have shed new light on how groups, whether of humans, animals, plants, or cells, interact, cooperate, and compete within a community. His work has had a profound impact in such diverse fields outside the realm of ecology as economics, finance, international relations, epidemics, bioterrorism, and health policy. And it has been one of his most fundamental insights to understand that the processes responsible for the emergence of patterns in socioeconomic systems are conceptually identical to the ones occurring in ecological systems. As he recently put it, we can learn a lot about how individuals cooperate, how leadership occurs, and even why individuals assume different roles in society by looking to something as far removed as a slime mold or a school of fish. In conclusion, whether Professor Levin belongs to the hedgehogs or to the foxes, to the lumpers or to the splitters, his work does exemplify the pinnacle of achievement in interdisciplinary research a work which has inspired a generation of researchers all over the world who are carrying on his unique approach. And I can think of no better recipient of a prize named after Luca Pacioli, a man with an unparalleled breadth of interest whom Leonardo da Vinci used to call maestro. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marcello. Now we come to the uh, award itself. Before 
uh, tributing the award, the motivation from the committee, which I uh, liberally translated from the Italian uh, official motivation, which I'm not going to read. The, the, the committee is partly here, so they can uh, uh, correct me if I made a mistake. So that's, that's the motivation for the award. Professor Levin is an expert in complex systems, in models and macroscopic processes relevant to ecosystems and the biosphere, which he studies in terms of ecological, behavioral, and evolutionary mechanisms. In recent years, Professor Levin has turned his attention to sustainable development with an emphasis on the links between environmental and socioeconomic and financial system, specifically in relation to the aspects that made them vulnerable to collapse and to the aspects that impact on the evolution and the development of their structure. Much of the ecological research developed by Professor Levin is dedicated to the evolution of diversification, the mechanism that sustain biological diversity in natural systems, and the implication for the structure and the functioning of ecosystems. Professor Levin deals with the intergenerational and intragenerational fairness, cooperation, and social role with particular attention to the management of public goods of, and common and behavioral evolution. He is a leading uh, international figure and also has a record of a collaboration with the Cultural Venetian Environment with the University of the Veneto region and the Venetian Institute of Science, Letters and Arts, where he has shown his outstanding qualities also as a teacher and as a, as a professor. These are all qualities which fit perfectly with the intended profile for the Pacioli Award, whose aim is to recognize the importance of the international profile of the candidate, the interdisciplinary nature of her, his, research and activities, as well as the potential to serve as a model for the new generation of scholars who carry their own research at Kafoskari. So for all these reasons, we award and we proudly uh, award the, uh, the Pacioli Prize to Professor Levin. Thank you very much for your very kind introductions. Thank you for the wonderful laudatio. It's really a great pleasure to be here in one of the, my favorite cities in the, in the world, seeing so many uh, friends. And I, I, I certainly express my gratitude to the committee for uh, this great honor. By the way, I have no idea how well this is going to run because there was a problem <laughs> with my uh, computer. So I, I will try to describe to you what it should look like. So um, it's also a, a great honor to, to receive a prize that's named after a great interdisciplinarian, Luca Pacioli. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, the various foundations and groups that have funded me in the past, and also especially to thank the university for this, uh, this great honor. Uh, the central problem, I think, that's facing our society is how we achieve uh, a sustainable future. And for that reason, um, we need to focus on how we grow economically without compromising the alternatives and the options that future generations have. And for that reason, I want to begin by focusing on what I see as some obstacles to making progress and then talk about the opportunities that these raise. So the first of these obstacles is what I call the swamp of uniqueness. It's the notion that I, many of my colleagues have expressed to me that every ecosystem is unique. Everyone studies a particular system and think that it has features that are dear to it and make it difficult to extrapolate. And yet, there are similarities uh, in 
the properties of ecological systems. Ecologists use a diagram of this sort to decide based on precipitation and, and based on temperature what sorts of vegetation to see. It's an approximation, but it allows us to generalize and to say where we expect to find rainforests, where we expect to find tundra, etc. So there is the potential for general theory. Indeed, one might argue, as many have, that every management challenge is unique. For example, the lobster gangs of Maine arose in order to deal with the lobster fisheries in Maine. The water temples of Bali, a system studied by the anthropologist Stephen Lansing, is a way to understand the management of the water distribution systems there. And the um, Tribunal de las Aguas of Valencia, which is the oldest democratic institution of Europe, in Europe, which arose in order to deal with irrigation disputes, continues to this day. These are all different attempts to solve what I think are similar problems, which I illustrate here by this diagram indicating something that's going to be the focus of my lecture, which is public goods or common um, pool resources, namely systems that are shared, in this case, by fishermen and oil companies and uh, small fishermen and large fishermen. These are all challenges that we have to address. How do we deal with these problems of the commons? Um, it is, I think, the central challenge facing the development of sustainable future. All of these require a systems-based approach. Systems-based approaches have, in recent years, been advocated for dealing with marine systems. Approaches have been developed for dealing with forest systems. We recently published a paper laying out a complex systems approach to dealing with forest management. The potential for general theories are there. We recognize the particular features of systems, but we also need to develop general frameworks so that we don't start anew each time we have a problem. The second obstacle is what I call the temple of the discipline, and that's why it's particularly appropriate to this lecture. In academia, we build silos. We build departments that are isolated from other departments. Luca Pacioli transcended such boundaries, emphasizing interdisciplinarity. This actually comes from a paper I've recently published with a former student of this university, a student of Carlo Carraro's named Alessandro Tavoni. And um, it, the diagram, however, is taken by, from a paper by Russfall and Bergstrom, but it's just to indicate to you the interconnections between disciplines, between scientific different disciplines, between the natural sciences and the social sciences, and the humanities, and law. We have to find ways to integrate all of these in addressing the great problems of our time. The third obstacle I identify is the fact that we're dealing with complex systems. Ecosystems, the biosphere, and socioeconomic systems are complex systems. Um, and so this raises the enigma, what I call, of complexity. Charles Darwin, and I give here part of a quote from, him, from The Origin of Species, spoke about the tangled bank and the interconnections of all species. And of course, there's a lot of attention much of it misguided in, in terms of understanding the balance between these species and the balance of nature. In the end, as in, and, as in physics and in other sciences, the real challenge is to understand the relationship between the whole and the parts that make it up, a theme that I'll come back to and um, relates to the scaling problems that were mentioned in my introduction. If we're going to focus on sustainability, we really have to take an approach that mirrors what went on with the much easier problems in physics, in statistical physics. If I want to make a cup of tea, I don't sit down and make calculations about what all the molecules are doing. I'm dealing with the emergent properties, the macroscopic properties of how I boil water. I understand that it comes about as in terms of the statistical properties of large numbers of molecules interacting with each other. But I don't solve those equations every time. I couldn't solve those equations, maybe not even once. And so in dealing with ecological systems, in dealing with socioeconomic systems, we need to develop an equivalent statistical mechanics that allows us to go from the movements of large numbers of individual agents 
to the um, collective behavior of ensembles of those agents, so-called complex adaptive systems. The fourth obstacle, and there are only five, so the list is not infinite, is viewing the present as the enemy of the future. But what do I mean by that? Well, we discount, and I'll come back to this, we discount the future and we discount the interests of others. Um, this is my picture of my son-in-law and my grandson. Uh, how much should we leave to future generations? That really is a great problem, and that's, I think, the challenge that separates many along the political spectrum is how important is our enjoyment today versus what we want to leave, not for ourselves, but for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. That is really what was at the core, that's at the core of the debate about climate change in this famous report chaired by Nicholas Stern, um, deciding what had to be done to deal with climate change, really centered on what one chose as the discount rate. How much do we value today versus the future? And finally, the last obstacle is us, what I call the most dangerous species. Overpopulation, overuse of resources is a problem, um, and that raises the challenge of the commons, the challenge of the area we all share and how we are going to uh, protect it and divide up its resources. Now, I've started by giving you a bunch of obstacles, but I, now the rest of the lecture is going to be more positive and to talk about what I see as the opportunities to deal with these problems. We are, after all, eroding biological diversity at unprecedented rates. And as you can see from this list, most of the reasons we're losing biological diversity are due to our own activities. Whether it's our activities in urbanization or agriculture or the like, we are the major cause of the loss of species and of the endangerment of species. Uh, and when we lose this biodiversity with it, we are losing the services that natural systems provide to us. Some of these are direct benefits like food, fiber, fuel, pharmaceuticals. Some of them are indirect benefits like the pollination services, uh, the mediation of climate, etc. And some of them are much harder to measure. Um, and even economists who work on these problems have not yet solved the problems of dealing with ethical and aesthetic values. At the base, when we lose biological diversity, we lose these services. And so the great challenge is to understand what it is about natural systems that provides these services and how we protect it. Now, whatever systems we're dealing with, whether we're dealing with forests or marine systems or freshwater systems, there are characteristic macroscopic features that characterize their behavior independent of the details of what particular species are there. Species may come and go, certainly individuals come and go, and, that, and the system may not have changed in any qualitative fashion. What we have to understand is when we have lost the essential features that maintain the services on which we depend. And that raises a number of scientific challenges and in particular mathematical challenges. Can we develop, as I mentioned already, an appropriate statistical mechanics that relates the phenomena uh, at the small scale to the large scale and that applies to the ecological systems and to the socioeconomic systems in which they're embedded? Can we model the emergence of ecological pattern? Um, can we relate to ecological and evolutionary scales? Are there ways we can understand whether systems are close to collapse? And finally, what can we do about the governance of these systems? Can mathematics help us with governance? Now, what's supposed to happen here is this is a movie. I don't know whether I'm able to run it. Uh, but this, yeah, there we go. Um, for which I thank my colleague Ian Cousin, which gives you an idea of the sort of self-organization problems that um, I've been interested in. How do we understand a flock of birds, a school of fish, in terms of the rules that individuals are using. Similar models have been applied to forested systems. Um, if that will run on the right, and I somehow doubt that it will, that would be a simulation 
No, it, it, it won't one, but that would be a simulation of, a, of the development of a forest that my colleague Steve Pakala and others have developed in which one looks at the rules that govern the growth of individual trees, how they shade each other out, and using that individual based model develop the dynamics of whole systems. Now, if this movie would run, what you would see is a pattern that's forming and but changing back and forth. One certainly can't hope to predict where every tree will be, but one hopes to be able to produce, predict the statistics of the system. And this can be extended to broader scales in which models of forest growth have been coupled with general circulation models, that is, models of, um, of the climate, uh, in order to understand vegetation patterns at much broader scales. At that scale, you do not attempt to predict, obviously, whatever, where every tree will be. You don't even necessarily predict where every species will be, but you focus more on, um, on the kinds of vegetation, what I showed you in the earlier slide. If this would run, what you would see is similar models that Mick Follows at MIT and colleagues have developed that are able to predict not where every species would be in the ocean, but where classes of species, like the large bacterial groups, Plecorococcus, uh, going down to the large eukaryotes, what the distribution looks like. Again, I don't think this will run. And of course, we're facing similar challenges in dealing with um, socioeconomic systems, with human systems. We try to avoid traffic jams of this sort, but stock markets collapse or rebound due to the actions of individuals. Um, and the dynamics may not be uniquely determined by physical factors either. There, there is some self-organization properties. So with my student, Carla Staber and others, I've been interested in the dynamics of savanna and grassland systems. Now what you see here is a map showing where savanna areas are in the globe um, and where forest areas are. There's some, in these regions, there are some areas that will always be forest and there are some areas that will always be grassland. But as you can see, there's some areas that are in the middle that we call bistable. That means they could end up being either forest dominated or grassland dominated depending upon initial conditions. And why does that happen? Well, it happens because fire is important. Grass burns, as long as the grass burns, the forest trees can't get started. But once they establish themselves, the forest trees uh, grow up and establish themselves. And so we can get a system which is maintained by grass and the fire it produces, or which flips into a forest tree dominated state. We modeled this um, with a simple set of differential equations. I know this is not primarily a mathematical audience. So I'll simply describe that what we've done is we've said the system is divided up into areas that are covered by grass, by saplings, or by trees. We've written a set of equations for them, analyzed those equations, and showed that the dynamics looks something like this. Let me take you through this. Precipitation is on um, the lower axis here. And what this says is at high precipitation, fire never occurs, and therefore the system progresses to a low grassland state. This is grass cover on the vertical axis. The system becomes a system dominated by forest trees. At low degrees of precipitation, fire is common, and the system becomes grassland dominated. But in the middle region, we get a bi-stability and the potential for hysteresis loops. This is important because it tells us that savannas may represent a, a, an alternative to forest, and as in the presence of climate change, we may see systems flipping from one kind of system to the other. We see similar things as in the work of Martin Schaeffer uh, with shallow lakes under eutrophication, which can flip from eutrophied states from oligotrophic to eutrophied states and back. And of course, we see the same thing in, um, in, in pathogen systems where the outbreaks of diseases 
represent alternative stable states. So we have to be thinking about how climate change will threaten such shifts. So let me, oh, actually runs. So some of you may recognize this wonderful video which was given to me by Claudio Carreri. These are starlings over Rome. Well, they're almost all starlings. If you look carefully, you will see a hawk that's driving this behavior. Uh, there was the hawk. Now, as a trained, being trained in fluid dynamics, it, I, I look at this picture and say, that looks like a fluid. And so we've made efforts, and so have other people, to describe these systems in terms of techniques drawn from fluid dynamics. Not only biological systems, but the socioeconomic systems with which they are linked are um, similarly complex adaptive systems in which individuals interact and give rise to global patterns. In 2008, that was before the global financial crisis really took hold, the financial crisis that you may have heard of, I um, wrote a paper with Robert May from the United Kingdom and George Sugahara, former student of May's, in which we said, well, we're only ecologists, but when we look at financial systems, we get worried because they look a lot like the interconnected food webs that we're used to, and we think that that means they're in danger of collapse. What we said is, who knows, for instance, how the present concern over subprime loans will pan out? Well, that was in March of 2008, and in the fall, and I think not because of our paper, uh, the um, Lehman Brothers collapsed, the stock markets collapsed. This has put all three of us uh, in demand now, advising financial firms of various kinds. I wish I had not only written this paper, but read it and paid attention to it, because it, it indicated to us that highly interconnected systems were in danger of collapse. Of course, there's been a lot of interest in the potential for sudden changes. You saw it in the, in, in the vegetation systems. You see it in the financial system. So the question is, when can we tell whether we're in trouble? Um, there's been a lot of recent interest, and Martin Skeffer has been in the lead on this, in anticipating critical transitions. A lot of it drawn from the literature in physics and phase transitions. There are some indicators that are often um, tell you that the system is nearing collapse. One is what's called critical slowing down. That means the rate at which the system is returning to its equilibrium um, is slower than it previously was. And associated with that is an increased autocorrelation, an increased var um, variance, and maybe the potential for the system to flip from one system to another. So this is a promising area, but it shouldn't be overhyped. We've often seen this in the past with subjects like catastrophe theory. Uh, one sees a phenomenon that has an analogs in systems we know, and we assume everything looks like this. We know that not all phase transitions indicate these sorts of signals, and so there are cautionary papers that I think needs to be heated. I'm not going to talk more about this today, but I think it's a very promising area. Um, but one where caution is, is needed. So scientific consensus is strong on many core environmental issues, and yet we haven't taken adequate action to address them. Why? It's not because we don't know the scientific answer. It's because we as societies and our governments don't have the commitment to commit to the common good and to cooperate in finding solutions that benefit everybody. Um, the central issues are ones of behavior and culture, of dealing with equity, both intergenerational and intragenerational, uh, understanding how to deal with public goods and common pool resources, and particular to cooperate in problems of the commons. It relates to the development of social norms and institutions that govern the commons. Uh, an example that's often cited and I find very instructive is foot binding in China. Foot binding in China was a practice sustained by social norms, stable over many centuries, and that suddenly disappeared, suddenly. 
What maintains social norms? How do they arise and how do they suddenly change? And how can we change attitudes towards environmental issues? I found this very depressing. Uh, Italy is not on this list, but this was a survey that Resources for the Future carried out in the US, in China, and in Sweden about attitudes towards climate change. Do people believe that climate change is a problem? Do they believe that humans are responsible? Do they believe that we can and should do anything about it? The US had the worst record. 40% of the people thought we should do something about it. China nearly twice as, um, as good, and Sweden somewhere in between. I don't know where Italy would have stood. The problem is we discount. We discount our own futures. When, a, when an attractive looking meal sits before us, and we discount the interests of others. This may be our future on airplanes. Can you imagine? I flew over here spending seven or eight hours on an airplane and having somebody sitting next to you talking on a cell phone the whole way. Uh, we're getting close to that. It would be a, a depressing experience. Uh, we live in a global commons in which individual agents act largely in their own self-interest and the social costs are not adequately accounted for. The challenge is how do we achieve cooperation at the global level? And the problem are, uh, are free riders like this gentleman who's on the train who hasn't paid a fare but's getting a free ride. That's where the phrase free rider comes from. Two centuries ago, William Forster Lloyd talked about the commons that we all share and that we overuse because none of us has sufficient interest in maintaining it. Garrett Hardin in the 1950s referred to this, went back to Lloyd's work and talked about the tragedy of the commons. And his solution to it was mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. But what Hardin was emphasizing was government regulation of this, and he later said that he had over and interpreted the role of government. It was left to people like Eleanor Ostrom, the late great um, political scientist and economist, who showed how cooperation and self-organization, self-regulation arose in small societies. You heard in the introduction the mention of reciprocal arrangements among East African herdsmen. This is work that Avinash Dixit and I, together with Dan Rubenstein, carried out. What, it, what is this work? Well, what it, what it says is, suppose that I have a farm and I have cattle I'm grazing on my farm, and my neighbor has a similar farm, and I'm having a bad year. And I say, can I send my cattle to graze on your land? And he says to me, well, why should I do that? And I say, well, next year our situations might be reversed. So he has to decide how important next year is. That's the discounting. But that's how insurance arrangements arise. Uh, and there are various uh, sophistications of this that I won't have time to talk about. But I mentioned Alessandro Tavoni before, and with work with Alessandro and Maya Schluter, who's now at the Stockholm Resilience Center, we took Lynn Ostrom's ideas and applied them to the regulation of water um, withdrawal systems or fisheries in which individuals could either choose to withdraw at the highest and most selfish rate possible or at a rate that benefited society. Of course, those that withdraw at the lower rates um, get less immediate benefit. So how do they enforce this? Well, they band together and they agree that we'll all withdraw at a lower rate and in fact we will punish, we will ostracize those who withdraw at the higher rate. So this is a social norm, this is the way it develops. And the question is, can we extend these sorts of arrangements to broader scales? Can we learn from these interesting case studies to how we get cooperation at the global level? Um, how do we go from the starlings to human societies and develop arrangements for maintaining the commons? Public goods problems are widespread, both in socioeconomic context like the one that William Forster Lord talked about and in ecological context like this termite mound uh, which is a shared arrangement among the individuals that's evolved over and over again in 
biological systems. Maybe you don't think about cancer as a public goods problem, but it is at two different levels. In particular, a tumor is a breakdown in the public goods. It's the profligate growth of some cells at the expense of the whole organism. But in recent years, we, um, there's been work which recognized that there are two public goods problems here, and we have a grant proposal pending to look at this. One is the tumor is a breakdown of public goods, but the other is that tumor cells produce substances, cytokines and others that are essential for the growth of the tumor. So if we can interfere with cooperation within the tumor by producing cells that do not produce the cytokines, maybe we can undercut the, um, the growth of the tumor. So public goods problems range from the cellular level up to global cooperation. Um, the greatest need in addressing these problems is to draw from one discipline to the other and to understand how we can, what we can learn from this for the management of human decisions, and especially to the roles of leadership and collective opinion. So ecological systems and socioeconomic systems alike are, as you heard in the introduction, complex adaptive systems made up of individual agents. And that perspective means, um, in both cases, if you leave the system to its own, it's going to eventually collapse. On the other hand, over-regulation uh, is also not the answer. Management's going to require a balance between a free market approach and a regulatory approach. We need institutions that are adaptive, and again, we can learn from biological systems. One of the most adaptive systems is one I've worked on is the influenza virus, which has been around a long time. It's not the same influenza virus that was around when you grew up in the sense that it's a different set of strains. In fact, it changes into what are called different subtypes every 20 years or so. How does it do that? Well, it's got these surface antigens that, um, that change, that mutate, and that are replaced. So the influenza virus has survived be by being constantly adaptive. Uh, perhaps a great example for us in thinking about how we regulate systems is the vertebrate immune system, the immune system that keeps us all healthy most of the time. How does it work? Well, it recognizes that we're going to be constantly assaulted by a number of pathogens, viruses, bacteria, but we, that we don't know what they are, and that therefore we need a system which operates quickly um, to reduce the threat, our innate immune system, things that attack uh, enemies quickly, um, a generalized rapid response, a recognition system, and then, as you all know, we have antibodies, a specialized <clears throat> adaptive response that learns and ultimately <clears throat> provides excuse me, memory in the system. So this is a model, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, for dealing with a, with a, a variety of threats. <clears throat> the financial economist Andy Lowe and I have a paper in review right now uh, applying these sorts of approaches to financial systems, but they apply to dealing with um, bioterrorism, with, with cybernetic um, terrorism, et cetera, we need something that quickly recognizes a problem, something that provides a generalized initial response, and something that is adaptive uh, and longer lasting. So to summarize, the, not only do we need systems that are adaptive, we also need to develop agreements that are going to work for dealing with problems like biodiversity and climate change at the global level. And here, I've been inspired in recent work by the work of a number of economists, in particular Lynn Ostrom, that talks about building modules, that talks about building units that, um, for cooperation. So instead of trying to get 200 countries to agree all at once, we build local arrangements that ultimately can be built together into global regulatory systems. Lynn Ostrom, in her Nobel Prize lecture and other work at about the same time, talked about what she called a polycentric approach, an idea first developed by her husband, 
Vincent Ostrom, for dealing with climate change. William Nordhaus, who is the president of the American Economic Association in his presidential address, talked about building climate clubs. So let me tell you how that works. And this is work um, with uh, Phil Hannum, Vitor Vasconcelos, and George Pacheco, which is currently in review for a club's approach to dealing with climate change agreements. The idea is as follows. Individuals band together into clubs or individual countries band together into clubs. And those clubs are technological uh, uh, affiliations for the exchange of, um, of, of technologies, of knowledge. Then individuals in those, within those clubs can agree uh, to certain curbs on, on um, environmentally harmful emissions. And so we have three categories of individuals. We have individuals who are members of the club, and then we have individuals within the club who are cooperators. The cooperators pay a higher price. They pay a base price, and they pay for the mitigation. The members of the club pay only the base price, but they may not actually mitigate and the outsiders pay nothing. And I won't go into details in the model, but I'll be happy to share the papers with anybody who's interested. There are two levels of benefits. Individuals in the club get a certain benefits um, that are from which outsiders are excluded, but individuals who actually pay the mitigation costs get additional benefits. And we set up a dynamic, um, a set of rules for the payoffs and trying to imitate some of the successful agreements on other issues in the past, individuals either join one group or another based on the payoffs. And the question is, under what conditions are such models um, feasible alternatives for dealing uh, with climate change? And what, what our models show is, in general, if you can get above a certain threshold lower level of cooperators, one can get to cooperative agreements which are sustainable, which provide more benefits for everybody than obviously than no agreements, but then agreements where you try and involve everyone right at the start. So sustained cooperation is possible even with free riding. Cooperation in these small club configurations yields larger benefits to everyone, um, and there are some complexities in terms of um, the potential for overshoot that we're still working through. So, can cooperation really be extended to the global level? This is the paper I mentioned before that Alessandro Tavoni and I recently published in, um, in a Nature publication, and which builds on the inspiration of Luca Pacioli. Namely, we need interdisciplinary approaches in which all of the sciences, the natural sciences, the social sciences, engineering, and humanities are um, involved in reaching solutions. Unfortunately, if we look to the biological examples, we find that the emergence of cooperation within groups exists, but it's often because those groups are competing with other groups. In dealing with climate change, in dealing with the global commons, we have to recognize that there is no other. The common enemy is environmental degradation. And just as in the movie Independence Day, we've got to get diverse groups together to recognize that we're all facing a common threat and that that's essential if we're going to achieve a sustainable future for our children and for our grandchildren. Thank you very much. Sono domande o remarks? Uh, professor Levin è felice di prenderle, altrimenti. Ma non in Italia. 
Un altro applauso e lo salutiamo. Allora possiamo uh, dichiarare conclusa la cerimonia, grazie di nuovo a tutti per essere venuti, è stata una lezione davvero ampia, credo che sia stata di grande visione, um, sono very thankful for, for, for the spirit of the lecture, the intensity which, which you gave it and, uh, and I think everybody and I'm sure everybody uh, has a lot to take home from, from, from what you said. Thank you very much again.